From these frameworks, we learn to implement check-ins. Check-ins for us are, at the beginning of any meeting, a time is set aside for all members to process where they're at in their life, in their day, and even in that moment. Um, it's a way to disclose how they're feeling entering the meeting, how they're feeling being with the collective at that time, and uh, how they're feeling even kind of entering, working all together at that moment. Um, additionally, we implemented checkouts, which are more about processing what happened within the meeting. Um, sometimes it's also an extended exten extension of processing previous events that we've done, maybe earlier in the week. Um, if at any point a person felt silenced in a meeting or if they felt that they silenced someone else, this is a time that we can address it. If any unsafe language was utilized, for example, if someone used the safe word saying they were uncomfortable, this is a time that you can use to check out about it. Um, and on a more positive note, this is a time that we often discuss how fun or productive we think a meeting was or how well we think that an event went. So it's not all nitty gritty. Sometimes it's really like, oh, we're happy that we got to eat snacks in Central Park on a big rock together. <laughs> <laughs> um, we also established ground rules for meetings, including communicating in I statements rather than speaking for the group or speaking for any group for that matter. Um, we keep meetings sober, and we have adjusted meeting times and locations to be, as Jacqueline said before, safe, but also to be accessible for all members. Um, we collectively make meeting agendas in advance online so that everyone is kind of up to speed and on the same page. Um, we also define specific collective rotating roles so that each of us can learn new skills, contribute, kind of constantly work on something new rather than getting stuck in the same thankless job over and over again for months on end. Um, we aim to basically prevent collective burnout and individual burnout with the with kind of these rotating roles. Um, additionally, which is a little bit harder sometimes, and definitely more of the interpersonal communication thing, is that sometimes personality-wise, certain people take up more space than others. They're more comfortable volunteering for things, and other people tend to feel less comfortable doing so. So we've tried to just be really communicative about what our own personalities tend to do and adjust accordingly and make room so that everyone is equally present in the group. Um, so, basically this dedication to maintaining interpersonal communication between all members has encouraged us to keep our collective closed. And what that means is we only solicit new members every so often and each new member goes through a rigorous application process with us. But we do feel that these tools are really applicable whether you have an open collective or even an organization or you're just organizing something event specific. Um, so I guess my question would be, have any of you guys, um, sorry, I'm from New York, so I say you guys, I, I realize it's completely inappropriate, um, have any of you all kind of dealt with these interpersonal communication issues while organizing, whether, you know, in feminist work, in activist work, or else, elsewhere, and have you found any helpful solutions? When we started working on LadyFest, we um, definitely did the kind of rotating roles thing, and we thought that was really good. And now that I'm thinking about it, that sort of fell out as the deadline of the event kind of loomed over us. And it was sort of like whoever was able to be there and do it then, and we lost a little bit of that structure. But I think it was really important for us to have that at the beginning, especially when we didn't know each other so well, so that there were like new people that were. We had facilitators and note takers that rotated every single meeting, and um, that was a really, really helpful thing for us to be able to like give. Not it's it's a way of also when you talk about different personalities, almost a way of helping like to force certain people who might not necessarily want to do that to like take on that role and realize that that they can and that they can help like guide the way the discussion is going. So that was something that was really helpful for us, and that we probably would should have maintained a little better, but um, you know reality and time kind of collapse on top of us, so. <laughs> happens to us. <laughs> yeah, I feel like that's why we have like all these other kind of ways to deal with it because of course reality, quote unquote, like you said, it sets in and there's always deadlines and stuff always goes by the other side. So we try to have like troubleshooting methods to work it out in the end. Then what else? I actually have a question about your process. Um, you mentioned that you have a safe word, and if it's used, you practice that. There's a check out, but how do you handle it if it's um, spoken in the moment? 
So basically the idea is that the person who uses the safe word is in charge. So they can either choose to in that moment deal with it, but if they're like, it's actually not that big of a deal, we can talk about it later, then checkouts is when we would say like, okay, so you know, obviously something arose before, can we talk about that now? And, yeah. Uh, I'm talking about the assumption that coalition building and allyship is easy, automatic, or anything other than a long-term intentional process that has to continually be happening. Um, so first, <laughs> we assume that we were the only feminist collective in the entire world. <laughs> 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 It was really cool, um, but actually our feminism was not happening in a vacuum, um, nor do we want it to. We wanted to have uh, like a huge connected feminist movement all over the city and the world uh, in Philadelphia. Um, <laughs> so we were like, we gotta look at these other groups. We want to explore coalition building and connect with other groups. So some of the groups that we've been able to work with and partner with are People of Color Zine Project, Support New York, and Right Rides and Safe Walk. Um, and through this work, trying to connect with these groups, we became aware of many more assumptions that we have been making. Um, and also just as a general principle that making assumptions is not conducive generally to being a good ally at all. Um, so a couple of those that we've worked through, um, we assumed that we were aware of all of the needs and norms of other groups. Um, I feel like this is echoing throughout a lot of the things that we were, you know, were raised before, but um, we were pretty oblivious about a lot of things, and we didn't, we didn't realize. So we learned the hard way to consider things like at our events, is it going to be all ages? Um, is there going to be alcohol served, wheelchair access, childcare, what time of day, what time of night? Uh, how long is it going to take? Do people even want to sit there for the whole time? Um, public transportation, cost. Is there going to be food there? Um, what if someone gets thirsty? Um, are there going to be cops there? Is there going to be immigration officials? Or is there going to be a security detail? Um, that doesn't feel safe to a lot of people. Um, and a lot of this also came from a punk subcultural background, which can be totally alienating to a lot of other feminists. Um, so we've also been working to kind of diversify our events, our music, our venues, our aesthetic, uh, who we're reaching out to what media we're using to reach out to people. Is it all on the internet, or are we getting paper flyers out too, things like that, um, so that it feels more welcoming to many different types of feminists, because um, there are a lot in this place. Um, we also assume that talking the talk was the same as walking the walk, uh, and it is not. Uh, we see our feminism as intrinsically linked with anti-oppression struggles around race, and gender, and ability, sexualities, class, but unless we're an activist in a public way, it, I mean, very much to other groups. Um, so, but we were confronted with the question of how do we even come to learn what our privileges are if part of what makes privilege privilege is that those who have it are blind to it. Um, so we began a monthly ally work meeting where it's part of our, we meet four times a month, once a week, um, and we rotate through four different meeting themes, and one of them every month is ally work. Um, and um, we will pick an article and read it and discuss it. And then we'll talk about how it can apply, how it applies to us personally, and how it might apply to our collective life, both within, within us, in our meetings, and then outside in our events and you know, our, our public, the public sphere. Um, so for example, we just read an article about the Kamani Gray shooting in um, Brooklyn by the NYPD. And then we read an essay by Harold Russo, who's a feminist disability rights activist. Um, and I guess the most important thing we've learned is that we don't name, we don't get to name ourselves as ally. That's something that we must earn from other groups. Um, and we really, in order to do that, always have to be open to learning um, and avoid making assumptions about other groups and their needs. Um, and that sometimes the best allyship is stepping back, making some photocopies, doing some shit work, doing publicity, doing fundraising. Um, publicizing other projects and promoting other projects without needing to be kind of like in the limelight of them. Um, and that if we hit a wall when we try to connect with another group, that's not a problem that's going to happen forever. But um, giving up after we hit that wall is a problem. Um, so being able to kind of keep coming back to the work, keep, co keep coming back, um, you know, be willing to kind of mess up a lot um, and miss things and then try to fix it again, that's our task. Um, 
and that always trying to keep in mind that there's we don't know the experiences of others. So it's for us, allyship is more of like a stance that we try to work to maintain rather than something that, okay, we got this now, we're you know moving on. We always have to be kind of working at it. So I'm curious if you guys have any, you know, and L, <laughs> if you have any experiences where you were trying to connect, I mean, the, the working with, um, what is it, government? Mm -hmm. I don't know a specific example, but trying to work with another group, trying to work with another space, trying to, trying to connect with another group or partner with another group. Well, I know, um, I'm trying to start something about the temple, and a lot of people kind of see like the QSU at our school, which is the Queer Student Union, as like the same thing as like a place, a space for feminist activities, which is like very kind of an awkward assumption to make that like anybody of feminist mind is in the QSU and vice versa. Right. So like, we kind of face. And how have you have you worked that out between the two of you, or? I'm well, like it's like super baby, but um, <laughs> like I think that it's just a matter of like understanding the separation between the two, but also kind of the the way that we could work together and yeah. combining our power on campus because they're obviously an organization with a lot more visibility than like a baby organization. Mm -hmm. um, remembering that other organizations may be just as like disorganized and dysfunctional as yours, and they may be struggling to establish themselves also, yeah. and um, you may get different messages from different individuals in an organization, and um, kind of along the same lines, to like be aware of tokenization, you know, like, oh, we need to be allied with a race organization, now we need to be allied with a, uh, you know, mm -hmm. class organization, stuff like that. Mm -hmm. and, and remembering not to just like use a leader or one spokesperson mm -hmm. as like to speak for your whole organization. Um, for that, that is such a good point. And, and, and can you trust that uh, in a group you're getting different communications possibly from like how um, cohesive is a message coming from a group when it's actually a bunch of people working together and it may be people may be having different experiences within the group. We have this concept of the front line. Um, it's in the the pamphlet called Organizing Cools the Planet, and it's about organizing around climate change, but it's actually very useful for any type of organizing that you're doing, so I would check it out if you read. But the concept they use is the idea of a front line. So um, that's, a, that's a, a front line community is a community that's experiencing oppression, has been able to name it, and is organizing against it, and it's something they can claim. And you can, we all have different front lines that we're able to claim in that way. So you can help a group that's working with a front line that's not actually yours to claim, but that's a form of solidarity or allyship. So being mindful, I mean, what that gives us two tasks. Number one, to first reflect on ourselves and look at what's our front line, what are our front lines that we actually can claim. But then also thinking about, okay, if other people have different front lines, how can we strategically position ourselves so that we're engaging in supporting their goal in a thoughtful way, rather than just saying, you know, okay, let's go, we believe in this too, we're all feminists, you know, or, or we're all queer, or we're, let's, you know, it's a little bit more nuanced than that, depending on who's participating or, you know, what, what the group's goal is. Um, so we, that's kind of a framework that we found useful. Um, I was just gonna like I thought that I'd be giving you up for I guess like since I started organizing or like when I started organizing at sixteen like my analysis was a lot different and like I made like so many mistakes and like I'm really embarrassed about it but um like like tr the whole like trying to find the intersectionality between like your organizing group and like all these other organizing groups and like. A lot of mistakes I made when I was a kid was like, instead of trying to build like real relationships with other organizations, like just kind of like co-opting their movements as like to be like, look, we're allies, and it's like not how it goes. And it's like actually like a huge like forever process to like actually build <coughs> groups in your community and like build really real relationships. Right. Um, so, like, mm -hmm. 
same. We're doing. We're in the same. same, same. <laughs> yeah. yeah. We've made mistakes too. Yeah. <laughs> you yeah. know. Um, I migrated south to Philadelphia, so I live here now. But I try to um, work before the birds when I can. Um, and I'm going to talk about the assumption that we made that we are all work and no play as a collective, and that self care wasn't necessary um, within our organizing. Um, self care is necessary all of the time, <laughs> within organizing and not. Um, we assumed that we were work machines, basically, especially when we first started out, and we were literally just all work and no play. Um, Organizing is really hard, um, and it's continuous, and it goes on, and you know it's never ending. And um, in order for us as a group to perform efficiently, as well as mindfully to ourselves and each other, we realize we also need to take a step back and just breathe and be. Um, Self-care, both collectively and individually, um, is just as important in organizing as it is in our everyday lives. Um, this means, as Kay was talking about before, checking in with each other, whether that's about our schedules, our mental well-being, um, tasks that we've agreed to do, and check-ins are a really good way to sort of just let the group know where you're at and have them come to an understanding like, okay, so you've had a really rough week, so you might not be too present at this meeting or, you know, sort of issues like that. Um, we all have really busy lives outside of the collective, as I'm sure anyone that did Lady Fest organizing has really busy lives and sometimes it's really overbearing and you kind of just have to be like, this is what I can handle and this is what I cannot handle. Um, so that being said, a big part of self-care is being able to say no. Um, if you agree to a task, and if you agree to 15 tasks, and you realize, what the fuck, what have I done? <laughs> um, it is okay to say no. It is okay to say, you know what, I can handle this, but I can't handle this. And I think that at certain points in our organizing, we just felt, we've always been a smaller um, collective, and I think that sometimes it fell upon us to think, I have to do this. I don't really have a choice. There's only so many of us. The work's not going to get done if I don't agree to do this, and that's not the case. Um, you have to take time for yourself, and you have to recognize what you can and can't do. So saying no is a, is a huge, important part of organizing. Um, Self-care also means having fun. <laughs> um, you know, we love organizing, but when it comes down to it, organizing is work. It is hard work. I'm sure everybody that's done organizing for Lady Fest or other organizations has realized that it is hard and you bust your butt, and <laughs> it is work. So we came to this point where we realized that we needed to have some fun. Um, out, you know, and of course we have fun in our meetings, but that's still work. And so we realized that our relationships with each other, with organizing, are one thing, but that isn't enough. Um, we needed to sort of nurture our relationships outside of the collective um, because not only are we a collective but we're friends and we're a support system to each other um, and better organizing comes with better interpersonal relationships so we um, started as someone had mentioned earlier um, having four different meetings a month so we have a social meeting now so instead of sitting down and doing organizing um, unfortunately, I couldn't make it to this one, but I think the last one was everybody sitting in Central Park eating snacks <laughs> um, <laughs> instead of organizing. Um, we have holiday parties, we have taken retreats, we have gone to Spa Castle, which if you don't know what that is, it is a castle-shaped spa in <laughs> New York, um, and it is a magical place, and if you get naked, if you're comfortable with that, um, and it is awesome. And uh, so we would do things like that, and it's just really important to sort of take a step back from your organizing once in a while and saying, okay, where are we at within our personal relationships as a collective and with ourselves um, individually with organizing? So um, has anybody had any experience with that, with maybe overextending yourself or literally all work, no play? Um, and how have you come to handle that? Or even if you've just come up with any fun ideas to sort of <laughs> break your work up. We're going to the Russian baths in Cheltenham on Monday. Okay, yeah. Some of us, if you'd like to come. <laughs> <laughs> it's me and Brian, I think. But anyone's invited. <laughs> cool. Yep. That is a great thing to do. <laughs> Obviously, we can relate to that. <laughs> assumptions we've grappled with um, in relation to bringing new members into the collective, of which I am one. Um, so I think one of the dilemmas um, of being a group as we are with a consensus-based decision-making process is how to find the equilibrium between respecting the unique experiences and perspectives of each member on the one hand, but also preserving the identity of the collective as a whole. So as a new member, one of the assumptions I encountered and I even felt prey to myself um, 
and that I think we've worked on processing is that each member felt equally comfortable putting herself forward as a spokesperson for the collective. Um, and I should say that I think this assumption flowed in part from the fact that each member is accorded um, the same respect, bears equal entitlement to have a voice and shape the collective processes. So in a way, it's an assumption that flows from, from a positive thing. But in fact, we've discovered that uh, acclimating new birds demands a measure of shelter and nurture um, in which they may not want to bear the expectation of having to speak up and the cultivation of a space in which they can comfortably explore their feelings about the place they occupy in the group without the pressure of external scrutiny. So I'll discuss this briefly just using two examples. One uh, was of a, an aspiring journalist who came to profile us, um, and the second is my first experience of tabling zines with the birds um, at a distro. So when I joined as a member of the collective, I was excited about having a safer space to put my politics into an encounter with other reflective people who cared about combating oppression and discrimination. Um, so this started even with the process of having um, prospective members fill out an application, which as an applicant appeared to me as less of a screening process and more of a stimulus for reflection about motives for wishing to join and an opportunity to explain how my life and organising experiences had shaped my feminism. Um, so the process of induction involved an initial four meetings with the collective, uh, during which it was not assumed that we would necessarily feel that we fit. Um, we had many openings to ask questions both at the meetings and afterwards by email if we didn't feel comfortable raising something in person. So at the end of this uh, full rota induction, um, each of us was given uh, a series of options by email. To so one was to continue, but with questions to discuss at the next meeting. Two was to continue, but with questions to discuss at either an individual level um, in email or in a private meeting. C was we could continue and felt totally comfortable with going forward, and D was that we would choose not to continue. So presenting us with this suite of options from the start um, ultimately uh, gave us a space and validated our choices regardless of what um, choice we ultimately made. So I, I felt immediately at home with the birds, um, and when a journalism student asked to write about us, I was excited to discuss with her um, how the birds helped me to grow in my feminism and made me more attentive to inclusivity and communication. Um, so in one small example, while drafting the group's newsletter, I failed to see that a particular form of words for a light-hearted event we were promoting was not trans-inclusive, um, and another member had pointed this out to me. But instead of feeling proud of what such examples said of the thoughtfulness of the collective while talking to the journalist, I found myself feeling anxious about presenting an intellectually coherent explanation for my politics in order to do justice to for the birds. I became concerned that the examples I gave were inadequate, or that I wasn't capturing what we were about, basically. Um, this was partly also because over the course of my own adult life, um, I've moved from what I would say is a more genteel form of liberal feminism towards adopting a more radical approach with a post-structural bent. Um, and uh, I, I was worried that I was failing to express this evolution um, and would do, uh, do a disservice to both the birds and myself. So tabling with the birds at my first zine fest elicited similar feelings. Uh, because I hadn't read all of the zines cover to cover, perhaps this says more about me than anything else, um, wasn't completely familiar with their contents, I found myself also feeling anxious at the thought that I would be required to explain them and wouldn't be able to do so, and moreover that any failure would be a reflection on my suitability to be a member of the collective. So in, processing, um, in the processing that we did as a group after these experiences, I think we realised the importance of minimising or at least filtering outside scrutiny of um, new members as they're finding their feet, and also to give new members the opportunity to become familiar with the processes of the collective as a whole, such as with an opportunity to um, meet the distro and familiarise themselves with the material that we were carrying. Um, at the same time as a new member, one of the assumptions I felt crazy was feeling like I had to uphold some kind of doctrinal purity that encapsulated the bird's core politics and mission, um, when in fact, uh, at you know, organising, we don't ascribe to the idea that there is only one particular kind of feminist orthodoxy. Um, so we recognise that being a good feminist means acknowledging there are a multiplicity of ways to be one, that we need to feel comfortable making mistakes um, and reflecting on them, and that we can expect in the course of our own activism for our views to change and evolve. So my anxieties as a, new bird, as a new member and the bird's willingness to address and process them affirmed for me the fact that a collective isn't a fixed entity for which any one member is a mouthpiece, so much as an organic and beautiful thing that exists in the spaces and potentialities between us as it does in the content of our own politics at any given moment. Um, so I guess my question is whether any of you have had experiences either bringing new members into an organisation or being a new member yourself and... Um, how you experience that tension between um, the uniqueness of your own experience and the organisation that you are becoming a part of. Or perhaps any examples that you've used to sort of make, um, make new members or new people you're organising with feel comfortable. Um, 
opportunities we've given them to reflect on their own space within the collective or within the group. Yep, at the back. I have a similar, similar scenario with journalists as well. Um, and I definitely like repeated myself over and over and just like felt really nervous. I totally understand what you were saying. But um, I feel like a lot of folks that were relatively new, uh, especially to the politics of the organization, were, uh, were really nervous and didn't, were like, no, no one wanted to talk to the journalists. Uh, so I kind of just like have to do it, um, <laughs> but yeah, I don't know if that's a good example, but I, I, I know, I understand that kind of. For sure, for sure. As well. Yeah, and I think it's any any kind of outside attention immediately. I mean, we even found, even when we weren't talking to the journalist, if she, if she did come to one of our meetings and it kind of subtly changed the dynamic. Because it's almost like, you know, I'm about to give the nerdiest example of it, but like the Heisenberg uncertainty principle, you know, like you can't change, the way, when you're having someone observe you, um, it completely changes the dynamic of the group just because you know you're being observed. So, it's, uh, yeah, definitely relate. Yeah, and it, it brought stuff attention to us because I feel like, is it okay if I disclose like For what sure. occurred? So Sally raised it and was so like almost nervous to raise it and I was like, are you kidding me? Maybe we should have thought that the first event that we were doing with our new members shouldn't have had a journalist present. Maybe we should have thought of that. Like, you know, it's kind of our bad, not yours. I think it was a positive experience. Yeah, overall. yeah, yeah, yeah. But, you know, <laughs> So, oh, oh sorry, just have one more at the front. I think I think that like anytime you're like starting a group, like any kind of like like or like recently or the latest group that I was part of having was like a support costume, which is like you think like like we had this whole issue where it's like we're not experts on this, and it's like no one's ever at a point where you're plateau and you're like really good at the thing that you're doing and you're not going to get better. So. Yeah, and like, any time we have a new member, it's just like, we're not any better at this than you are. Mm -hmm. yeah. Has anyone ever had the experience of joining a completely new group and not knowing anyone there? Or having a group exist that you want to join, but you like, are terrified? Because <laughs> I used to wait outside of birds meetings, like, holding back and vomit so nervous. <laughs> and now I you know because of these sorts of things like I feel like it's I feel like I belong here but that's I don't know, we talk about it all the time. Well we'd like to go to that meeting but I'm terrified. You know, I would have to talk to everyone or you know that's the other part of this. Like, how do we how do you do that? Like and how, is it the group's responsibility to be welcoming? Is it closed? Is it open? I um I guess uh, a year or two ago when I was starting college, there was a bunch of groups I wanted to join, and um, they were they all had like some sort of like queer or feminist slant to them, and I found that taking a friend helped immensely. But even if I didn't take the friend, I think the people in the group were so excited to have new members that they almost like I guess diminish your nervousness for you. That's good. Yeah. It's best case, best case. Thing. Yeah, I know. <laughs> I also want to say that sometimes when new people come into your group, I know that I'm anxious, like, am I doing enough to make this person feel welcome? So oh, yeah. just because if someone is being remote or weird to you, it's not because they don't want you there. It's because it's like, oh, you know, they're wrestling with their own social skills. Yeah. <laughs> it's like we, we had a potluck Friday night, and I'm like, oh, yeah, duh, I should remember to introduce myself to people and smile and say hello, and that went a long way. Right. And like name tags. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we take a lot for granted when you know you get into a group mind, you, you, you take it for granted that the new person comes that they don't know the personal jokes, they don't know the history, they don't know, and and we have to kind of like slow down and incorporate them. Yeah. Yeah, we were an open collective, but like even at meetings where we knew that everyone there knew each other's names, we like still went around and did like my name is Grace, like this fun fact I did like an icebreaker kind of thing right, what I did this yeah. week, just so it was part of our routine to, mm -hmm. so when there was a new person there, it wasn't like, oh shit, we have to introduce ourselves now because this person showed up, right. like, you know. Yeah. Stop, or if there's anything you want to touch on extra or whatever, now is the time. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, perhaps you had um, a way, we've discussed some of the solutions that we've used to solve some of the problems, but if you have something that you think we could have done differently or um, some kind of problem-solving mechanism that you think would be useful. 
What do you think the, because you guys are a closed, collectively you have to apply to get in. What is the benefit of being closed versus open? Well, um, there are a lot, and we sort of um, grappled with this for a while just because we realized it was really um, exclusive and, you know, we were putting we were cutting out a lot of people that wanted to be a part of it, and then there was another, there's permanent wave that started in New York, and they're an open collective, and um, we actually had a meeting with them, and I think it really uh, solidified why we are a closed collective, and I think open collectives can work for certain groups, but for us in particular, um, we, well, here's an example, I guess, just to be a little bit broad. We, ha we were open for a little while. Um, I brought in a newer friend to the collective, and, um, was really into feminism, you know, women's studies, major or minor, I don't remember, and we came, we had a lot of issues with her making racist remarks, um, had a lot of issues confronting her about it, she wasn't really willing to do the work, and it really disrupted the group um, in a way, and there was no way for any of us to see that, I mean, you know, we were all constantly working on our shit, you know, we all have some sort of racism or something going on and we all have to work with this, you know, and this person was just not willing to deal with it. And I think because of that situation in particular, we were like, we can't have this happen, like, every, we'll never get anything done if we're constantly processing the members individually, you know, and if they're not receptive to that, um, it really caused a rift in our organizing. Um, so that's just one reason, if anyone wants to know. Yeah, I feel like part of what Cynthia is saying is like we all feel like a personal responsibility to constantly like challenge ourselves. I mean, most of the all the different like assumptions and all of our kind of strategic ways to move past them all have to do with just like challenging yourself on a regular basis. Like situations are constantly changing. I mean, you know, we you know we just have stuff comes up with other organizations, stuff comes up in the news, and we just feel like we constantly have to kind of make sure that we're challenging ourselves and dealing with privilege up front. So essentially if we were running into members that weren't willing to address that, then it was then it just wasn't working because we feel as a collective that that's a really big part of what we do. Mm -hmm. um, so that's kind of that's kind of for us a big reason to stay closed. However, we did this workshop last year at Combating Latent Inequality Together Fest in New Brunswick, New Jersey and we had someone else uh, raise the point that they were from a more like rural area and they couldn't really afford the privilege of having a closed collective because they needed to band together. Um, so what we offered up is that even if you're going to have an open collective, doing these things like establishing ground rules, communicating regularly, and just having a system in place can help keep even an open collective like a safer space. Yeah, and the only thing I'd add too with a closed collective that I've really come to appreciate is that we know each other really well and we trust each other. It like we just trust each other completely. And so it's helpful in getting things done too. Just mm -hmm. like, oh I wanna post this blog or I wanna do this thing and, and instead of like like we used our screening process before we put anything on the internet it used to be a lot more intense, but I feel like because we know each other so well, we are kind of willing to take that leap if not everyone has time to review something or, or something that nature is that we know each other so well, we know um, what we're going to think in a way. And you know, again, you have to be careful with that, you know, making like on the target about making assumptions, but it also just be just being working together and there's only, um, I guess, eight to 12 people depending on the day. We have the day. There are different <laughs> people living in different cities, but um, you know, you get to know each other really well and it's, it's kind of incredible. Mm -hmm. And I mean, I think the other thing um, in terms of the, the collective growing, taking on new members, like as a relatively new member myself, um, to touch on something Kathleen mentioned, which is, I mean, I'm Australian, moved to the city relatively recently, so, you know, came to the collective without knowing anyone, but because I'd filled out this application and it was very thoroughgoing and I talked about a lot of the experiences that brought me to feminism, um, I felt like, but that even though I hadn't met you yet, you already sort of knew what you were getting, and so I think it sort of, <laughs> it means I didn't, and having then accepted me, I didn't feel like I was sort of going to come and have this, you know, completely jarring encounter with people who thought totally differently. So I think that having that screening process can actually be um, really useful in terms of ensuring you have shared goals and, yeah, working effectively together. What kind of questions do you guys ask on the application? Um. <laughs> what would you remember? Uh, uh, a white supremacy token? 
experiences and how they've informed the way that you think now and even some stuff that's like uh, what language do you find harmful in general mm -hmm. and that's just kind of like a general question and often there are responses about stuff that you encounter in the outside world and oftentimes it's stuff that you encounter within the activist world mm -hmm. so yeah. They're relatively open-ended, it's yeah, not like the bird, it didn't seem to me like <laughs> there were kind of pitfalls or things that you were ticking off against, like, oh yeah, right, oppression, <laughs> tick, you know, it's more just trying to get a holistic picture of people, I think it's much anything else. That's a good word. And I found like overall in organizing, having some sort of application, even if it's just describing a little bit about your personal politics, really just helps to ensure that the people that are going to be involved are going to be serious and like, you know, because Incorporating new members is going to take a lot of work, so we want to make sure that you know by doing that work, it's going to help out the collective, and that um, you'll be able to share responsibilities once that person joins. I'm serious about it. Um, what were some of the ways that you got that application out into the world to people who are not like you? Like we had an open call for the UTS participants, and that's something we thought about a lot. Like, how do we get this to people who like may not see it just because they're not our, like friends or in our social group circle? Mm -hmm. <laughs> oh, we, 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 we talked actually about that talked about it a lot. Yeah. Yeah. There was a lot of pavement pounding. Um, we put it online and then we tried to get the, we made it like a, a PDF and an attachment and also on the web, I don't understand the internet thing, uh, into the text on the internet and then sent that to as in as many different forms as we could to different listeners, different groups, different um, other types of coalitions that we thought like, okay, maybe some people will like that, mm -hmm. you know, um, that we don't usually work with, but they'll catch it because they're involved in this other project. Um, and then we also had physical paper flyers that we took to a bunch of different events, gave to other groups, and uh, specifically locally around that time, there was a bunch of events that we were working in partnership with other groups, and we had a big stack sitting mm -hmm. there. Um, I think the coolest thing that happened around that time was that POCZ project we worked with was touring. Mm -hmm. And so we were able to give, I mean, they were taking them all over the country, but we still thought, I don't know, maybe they have friends or they were, you know, like they're still like, so we even kind of spread them nationally. around yeah, yeah. nationally <laughs> as well. At, um, <laughs> we're partnering with those groups and those are the spaces that we're occupying and we're able to reach a bunch of people. We are we are at um, two two fourteen. I've been I've been trying to the task to summarize this, but um, I think, especially from the examples that everyone was giving, it seems like um, for for you as a lot of the things that people were talking about, as well as for us. Um, so I'll make this a general theme. I think feel comfortable doing that. That these sorts of considerations of inclusivity and, and safer spaces and trying to connect with people that are different than us, just in general, um, in active, activist organizing and, and just in life, that it's, prevention is the best policy to the, to the largest extent that we're able to manage that given the way we're all socialized to be completely unaware of lots of things. Um, so to, to try to, uh, but the expectation is that we will try to plan for what could alienate someone, what could offend someone, what could make someone feel marginalized, because that's the way our society trains us to act, um, and to not to not take for granted that we've overcome all of that socialization just because we're doing organizing now. We haven't. It's going to come up again and again. Um, so to have a working process in place ahead of time as best we can and then, you know, to, to address those things when they happen and then as part of that another expectation is that there are going to be mistakes, there's going to be mess ups, there's going to be very uncomfortable conversations, people's feelings are going to get hurt, people are going to, we're going to look back on things and say, oh my gosh, we missed this, 
or oh my gosh, what an opportunity, you know, flew out the window because we were not even aware of X, Y, or Z things. But that, that doesn't mean we stop. That means we learn and we grow wiser from it and we keep going. Um, and I'm hearing a lot of that happening. You know, we get a breast pump room <laughs> that has a lock on it. We get, you know, these things that we that we take the wearing and keep it with us and keep going because it will ultimately enrich us and make our coalitions if we're working with other groups stronger um, and, and give us a more vibrant movement in general. So thanks everyone for coming and sharing. Thank you. Next up in here is